Uh, this program is entitled Put Your Cards on the Table. And it is uh, an exploration of the very intricately intertwined lives of Robert Schumann, Clara Wieck Schumann, and Johannes Brahms. Now these are three of the greatest composers of the 19th century. And they had a very interesting and intimate connections with one another. And, and we're using songs, diary entries, and letters, and short instrumental pieces, to give you a glimpse into the emotional world that they lived in. Um, to sort of give you a better sense of the context of things, I, I want to sort of tell you the <coughs> basics of their story so that you don't get lost along the way. And I don't, I don't think I'm, this uh, is not really going to be a spoiler kind of thing. I think that this is, I think you'll, you'll understand it all better if you, if you, if you have this little explanation. Um, Robert Schumann met Clara Wieck in 1828. At the time, Robert was 17, Clara was 8. Um, Robert was an aspiring poet and composer and pianist. And he had come to Leipzig to study with a very famous piano teacher, Friedrich Wieck. Friedrich Wieck was the father of Clara Wieck. And Friedrich had made his reputation by training Clara to be one of the great pianists of Europe. She was a great child prodigy. And already, by the age of eight, she had a name that was recognized throughout Europe as being one of the great pianists. And people considered her to be on the par of great pianists like Chopin and Liszt. So that's, that's something. That's really something. So uh, Robert came to Leipzig to study with Clara's father. And Clara um, was very intrigued by this older man who came to live in their house. Back in the day, if you went to study with somebody, often you would live in their house. So Robert was living in the Wieck household. And Clara was intrigued by this guy who was telling her ghost stories and stories from you know, the 101 uh, nights and uh, the Arabian nights. Um, Robert was intrigued by Clara, but as a child. He recognized that she was a child. He wasn't romantically attracted to her at first. But it's clear that she felt a special something for him right from the get-go. Well, Clara toured extensively. And the two of them had become close friends, and they had a tremendous correspondence. And this correspondence ranged all over Europe. One of them might be in Vienna, the other one might be in Paris. One might be in Hamburg, one might be in Munich. And so we have letters that travel back and forth across Europe, letters over years and years and years. And during the course of this time, they developed a real romantic relationship. Now, Friedrich Wieck, Clara's father, discovered that they had more than friendship going on and was furious. He really did not want to have Clara tied down to this, this guy that he thought of as a second-rate composer. So he put up many, many, many obstacles to, to their being together. And in fact, he, there was a, a period of two years where he did not allow Clara to write letters to Robert at all. And there's this giant gap in their correspondence. Um, but despite all of the obstacles that he put in their way, they nonetheless secretly got secretly engaged to one another. Now, when Wieck found out about that, he was really mad. And he took this terrible step of writing an 18-page declaration of all the terrible things about Robert Schumann and having it published in all of the major newspapers in Europe. <laughs> I mean, completely slanderous. Just a terrible, terrible, terrible thing. Um, so under Saxon law, a girl could not marry without her father's consent until she was the age of 21. And Robert and Clara petitioned the court for an exception to this. And there ensued this very long and complicated court battle uh, finally, as it turns out, they won. They were allowed to marry in 1840. And they started um, their married life together. And it was one of the great marriages of musical history because they studied scores together. They wrote fugues together. The Clara wrote a piano trio, and Robert followed suit by writing his own piano trios. Robert would write pieces of music, and Clara would play them for him on the piano. It was a really wonderful relationship, a, a, meeting, a real meeting of minds and spirits. Well, this 
lovely marriage went on for, for many years, but Robert from the get-go had had certain kinds of mental problems. And around, um, in the 1850s, these mental problems really started to come to the surface. Also around that same time, in 1853, a young man came knocking at their door. And this young man happened to be named Johannes Brahms. He's 20 years old, very handsome, a fantastic pianist, already a great composer. He swept Robert and Clara sort of off their feet with all of his, his genius. And it's clear from the get-go that, that uh, Johannes and Clara felt a great attachment to one another. Robert's mind was he, was, he was having mental problems, and Clara looked to Johannes to, to offer help and to offer some companionship during this time. It's not clear what ultimately happens between Johannes and Clara, but it is clear that they had a very, very, very intimate relationship in the, in the most emotional and spiritual way. Whether anything else happened, we'll never really know. Um, but Robert had a, a very terrible end, and Johannes was there during that time. In 1853, very shortly after Johannes Brahms came to their door, uh, Robert attempted to commit suicide. He had been hearing voices in his head, and at first, these were the voices of, of angels singing glorious music to him. And then, later on, those voices transformed into demonic voices that told him that he was a sinner and that he was going to be dragged down to hell. And Robert feared that he was going to do Clara and the children some great harm. And at one point, it just got to be too much for him. He ran out the door and threw himself into the Rhine River. Now, there happened to be many witnesses to this. They fished him out of the river and brought him home. And at that point, he was sent off to, uh, to an asylum where he spent the remainder of his years. Clara was not allowed to visit him in the asylum. Back in that day, you know, doctors the doctors felt that her presence would unduly distress him. And uh, they did not allow her to visit, and for many years, for, for a couple of years, did not even allow her to write letters to Robert. She saw him for the last time two years after he had attempted suicide, two days before he died. And um, of course, Johannes Brahms was present during all of this. Johannes was a great comfort to Clara. Johannes helped take care of the children, helped her run the household while Robert was in the asylum, and actually helped finance Robert's treatment in the asylum. It wasn't a cheap thing back in the day. Didn't have health insurance back then. <laughs> so then, um, you know, after, after Robert died, it's unclear exactly what happened between Clara Schumann and, and Johannes Brahms, but unquestionably there was this very important third figure in their lives who had passed away and who cast a shadow over anything that, that would ever happen between the two of them. So this story that we're telling you tonight is ultimately, um, well, the first half is a very happy story. It ends in a very, very happy way, the first half. The second half, not so happy. Just not quite so happy. But I think there's, at the end of it, also a great deal of um, hope and anticipation of possible things for the future. Anyway. We hope that you enjoy this evening. Put your cards on the table with Clara Schumann, Robert Schumann, and Johannes Brahms.